I'm uh, Greek Australian. That's why I look like this, but I sound like this. <laughs> Welcome to episode four of the Gringlish podcast. For some reason, I look like a Lebanese restaurant owner, but let's get into it. Okay, so I'll give you a bit of a life update. What's happened in the world of George Malos? Well, uh, the content machine is rolling. We're coming out with podcasts for Gringlish. We started another podcast, Broker Banter, which is focused on the online business world. Of course, where I have my business, e-commerce brokers, doing that with my good friend, Gareth Everad, and we got uh, some deals in the works. So some sponsorship for that one already. It's just started, so that's really, really good progress. Um, what else has been happening? So yeah, I've been in Greece. Um, uh, for a couple of weeks now, I will be here for the remainder of the year, most likely, of course, with a couple of trips, London, Barcelona, Cyprus, Dubai, and New York, most likely. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, the remainder of this year won't be that busy in the online business world, most likely, because interest rates are so high. Until they come down, things will be a little bit quiet, which is okay for me. Uh, we still have a lot of clients on the buy side, which are buying businesses uh, for very cheap. So. With all you know, good times and bad times in any industry, there's some people who are loving it, some people who are hating it. Um, because we have a two-sided kind of service, we have one buy side, two sell side. We benefit from um, being able to be stable regardless of the time. So for e-commerce brokers, it's never a bad time. But on the sell side, it is a bit quiet, which is fine. But that does mean I have uh, some of my, free, my own free time to work on other stuff. Now that means doubling down on content for e-commerce brokers. So we have, of course, consistent videos coming out for e-commerce brokers. YouTube videos means more traffic to our website, which means more sellers and buyers. So that's always good. Um, also doubling down on content for my personal brand. Uh, my personal brand is one I like to think, I like to identify as a dude who is an entrepreneur, loves history and does comedy, right? I think that's pretty much who I am. Plus, just tag on Greek as hell on there as well. So that's why I'm doing the Greenwich podcast, doing a bit of uh, history stuff, going through any kind of stories. Um, the response has been reasonably good. I thought we would get like no views on anything, on the podcast, on Spotify, on Apple, on YouTube, on um, uh, Instagrams, but actually it's been pretty good. Um, a few of our clips are very interesting to some groups like the history stuff, like the Roman tier list, Roman emperor tier list from episode one, um, picked up by like a Greek army, uh, like a Greek army meme page, right? You never know who's gonna find your stuff, you know, and I think that's kind of interesting. Um, on the comedy side, I did some stand up this last week, uh, which went reasonably well. Did some old material, didn't have time to prepare some new stuff, but we will do some new stuff very soon. I'll be hosting my own show in September, um, moving into a new apartment next month. So, you know, settling down a bit. Um, I've been pretty much 90 days in a new city for the past seven, eight years, uh, and that gets tiring. So, I'm going to slow down to a, a, a comfortable six months at a time, uh, most likely. Um, so probably divide my time between Cyprus, Greece, and New York um, for the foreseeable future. And um, I can do my you know, podcast, I can do my content from anywhere, which is a big plus. And of course, my business is online. So that's the update. Comedy, history, and business. Um, I'm, we're actually, today, we're starting to do some new content. Um, we're going to go to the streets of Athens and talk entrepreneurship and uh, business with the people, right? I'm um, gonna take our mics and just be like, hey, if you could start any business, what would you start? If you could, what is your dream career, right? If you could have any job, what would it be? If you could start any business and you knew you couldn't fail, what would it be? I'm trying to get Greeks to be a bit more, uh, to have a bit more hope. I've always had this, um, this thing I would always say, which was, in America, everyone kind of thinks there's a 0.1% chance they could become a billionaire. Maybe that's even higher. And everyone thinks they're going to become a millionaire in Australia and America. They're like, yeah, we could do that. No problem. But in Greece, in Europe, it's like millionaire. I'll be lucky if I make fucking 500 bucks this week, mate. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, and as a kid, you should have high hopes. Even if you don't reach them, try. God damn it, try. Imagine if I never tried. If I never had any dreams, I would still be working at McDonald's. And I might not be a billionaire, but fuck, this is still pretty good, you know? Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. And I think that positivity is a very good thing. And I call it aggressive positivity. I would describe myself 
and kind of what I do in content, in talking to people, doing university talks is aggressive positivity. And I think aggressive positivity in an environment that is aggressively negative is what is necessary to break through. The structures, the social structures and the cultural structures in Eastern Europe and in most of the world that is in the West and especially in Greece are one that puts down dreams, puts down positivity. We have a negative perception of everything. And I'm guilty of this too myself in, in some circumstances, but generally I'm ridiculously positive and I've broken through uh, the, the cultural, um, yeah, the cultural ways of which we live as Greeks, even growing up in Australia, um, but with aggressive positivity. And sometimes that aggressive positivity is very quiet, you know, just to yourself. Um, uh, on my own when I was growing up and I wanted to be an entrepreneur while I was working at McDonald's doing shipping containers all this stuff at the end of the day uh, a lot of people said everyone said I couldn't do this and I couldn't do that I couldn't achieve this and I couldn't do that and I said okay and then I went and did the work and I was aggressively positive to myself just my self talk was aggressively positive um, I didn't let, uh, let anyone bring me down and that is a very hard skill I look back on my last 13 years of entrepreneurship I think I'm most baffled and proud of not letting other people's negativity get to me. One, I always knew like, these people aren't gonna pay my bills. They aren't gonna put food in my fridge. They aren't gonna pay for the rent. They aren't gonna pay for the electricity. So why the fuck would I care? Why would I care? They're not putting food in my fridge, I am. So I'm gonna sit here and care too much, care that much about some, somebody who doesn't care about me in my good times, but they were willing to put me down. So I never really cared. I never let it really get to me. Um, and that lone wolf mentality, I don't know if that serves you in the rest of your life, in the remaining of your life. I don't think it's necessary in some circumstances, but sometimes you have to be aggressively positive. And someone says you can't do something, the only response is fuck you, let me try. Damn, <laughs> fuck you, let me try, I can't, let me try at least. Like in Greece, it's very, it's very common. I mean, I see this. I went for a run in a Trexe run club in Athens with, with George, uh, another, um, uh, the other half of the Terexia Run Club in Athens. Now, when I go running, anywhere I go, I can't wear a shirt. People think I don't wear a shirt when I run because I want to look strong, want attention from the ladies. It's because my nipples bleed. Yeah, I have uh, no shirts that are comfortable to run in. So I take my shirt off. I'm gonna sweat anyway, the sweat, the sweat is gonna make the shirt like three kilos, so I'm gonna hold the shirt now, three kilos of fucking weight. Why would I wear a shirt and my nipples are gonna start bleeding because of all the friction? So yeah, no shirt. I mean, it's not because I'm arrogant or I want attention, it's because my nipples are in pain, okay? So there's that. Secondly, everyone's staring at me because I have no shirt, it's 37 degrees like yesterday and I'm running in the middle of the day sometimes. If I don't wake up in the morning early to go run and I don't wait until the afternoon when it's a bit uh, cooler, yeah, I'm gonna be running in the sun. But that's what happens when you don't do things on time. You have to do it at a harder time. And everyone's staring at me like, look at this trello, quita to trello. Ti gine te do, quita to trello. Trexi, sto zesti toda? Po, 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 ti cani. Yeah, well, I am, and why aren't you? I'm oh, sorry I'm being healthy, dog. Sorry I'm being healthy here running, or you're smoking a fucking cigarette. I'm not, I'm not sorry about that. And George was saying to me, bro, everyone's staring at you. You should get, like, aren't you getting angry? I'm like, they're staring because I'm doing something dope. People are going to stare at you whether you're doing something bad or doing something cool. So you might as well do something cool, right? And if they're going to stare, good. You wanted that. You, you knew people. You wanted the attention for good reasons. And now here it is. You can't get mad at that. Anyway, point being, we're going to hit the streets and start asking some young people, some Greeks in general, what is your dream in your career? And maybe some older people, what was your dream in your career? What did you want to do when you were a kid? Um, I think Greece needs a dose of uh, aggressive positivity. And I would like to help that, you know, people do that. So if someone says, oh, I want to do this, I want to do that, let's, uh, you know, let's help do that. Uh, but that's that piece, that's what we're doing. Let's get on to the next topic. I'm going to run from the most northerly point of Greece to, to um, the most southerly point of uh, uh, mainland Greece. So I'm just gonna move over to my screen. Let's do a little uh, explanation of my crazy plan. If we zoom out from Athens, you'll see a larger map of Greece. Now, my plan 
is, just to explain to you the craziness of my plan, to go from the northerly point of Greece, which is this place just at the border of Bulgaria, all the way to the bottom of mainland Greece, which is here in Mani. So generally speaking, it's about a thousand kilometers. Um, I'll get into why and how and all this stuff later. But let's first confirm so you can see exactly what I'm talking about here. So let's avoid ferries, put in kilometers, and uh, I said avoid ferries. There we go. And then it goes to Bulgaria, so we can't have that happen. So put it over here. So, as you can see from the map, I'm planning to start at the border of, with Bulgaria, go to south, now I understand there's a bit of a mountain range here, which is not gonna be easy. Basically go through Thrace, go through Thessaloniki, Halkidiki, and Larissa, Larissa, Thiva. I'll probably, to be honest, make a detour through Athens, to be fair, which is gonna add about 200 kilometers to the distance. So now we're talking about 1,200 kilometers. Megara, Istmia, you basically passed uh, through Nefbak, uh, uh, what's it called? Through, um, oh my god, what's it called? Naflio, Sparti, down into Mani, the heartland of Greece, and down to the absolute bottom, southernmost tip of mainland Greece, which is Cape Dainaron Lighthouse. Looking, of course, over the greatest place on earth, Githra. So it's a, long, uh, it's a long trip. Now, let's get into why, right? Um, so, first things first. I ran this button 5K, 10K, and 25, 21K, which ended up being 25K, which 25K over mountain ranges in Andorra with obstacles, that is pretty brutal. Um, but it kind of got me hooked on ultra racing, right? Um, and look, for me, the crazy thing with ultra racing and all this stuff is that I'm not a runner. My body is like, height is like 90% torso. I have the shortest legs uh, in the country, but that's kind of what makes me want to do it. You know, like, because I'm not cut out for this stuff, um, I kind of uh, want to do it. It's kind of like a fuck you. So really my running uh, career started uh, maybe I was like 15, 16, pretty much when I fully stopped swimming. My mom took me swimming every fucking day, basically, or every weekday from six to 16. I did nippers, which is like this sport, this, this beach sport activity. Um, on weekends, I did swim club run training, uh, swim club uh, training at Dick Kane's swimming pool in Cars Park in Australia. He ended up being a pedophile, apparently. <laughs> but uh, he was a good coach. Um, I did that for years and years and years. And we would go every single day, like 5 a.m. I would hate waking up, but we would go do it. I'd be there with my friend Tim, Nathan, and Tim, Nathan, Nathan, Tim, and Jack, the brothers, who are legends. And uh, we'd go swimming, and we would do swimming carnivals and all this stuff, and I had a lot of childhood memories there. But that definitely instilled a work ethic in me and a training ethic and that, you know, you've got to push your body and stuff and be in good form. Um, and then when I started going to high school, you know, we stopped doing that. And um, at Newington, they have a pool, lucky enough, and I joined the water polo team. I started doing swimming training relatively consistently, like once or twice a week. But then after a while, I'm like, you know, I'm done with swimming. My mom forced me to do it for so long, I'm kind of over it. That's when I got into the gym. Um, and also around that period, I started running on my own accord. I, started, I joined the rugby team in, uh, in New at Newington, and I was bigger than everyone because I was this size, basically with chest hair and a beard, uh, when every, all the other guys were skinny little white dudes, and then, you know, during that year, everyone's like, dog, just take the ball and run into people. Don't run, don't try and run around. You're not a runner, you're not a runner. Just, you're a bulldog, you're a fucking mule, just drive, bulldoze people, okay? And then two years later, everyone you know, shot up uh, from puberty and then I ended my uh, rugby career. But during that time, I remember a coach said to me, 
Mr. He had a tan, I remember. Meekin. I don't know, probably not. I don't remember these names. And uh, I remember he's Scottish or something. He's like, dude, just don't run. Just go down with it. And I was like, fuck that. And then I started running. Uh, I also knew just cardio wise, I needed to get, you know, I might be going to the gym, but I got to get my cardio in order. For me, it's very easy to put on weight, very hard to lose weight. So I uh, started running. Just, I remember, I remember it all actually happened in one, I kind of got the shits one, one uh, New Year's Eve. It would have been the same New Year's Eve where I got into entrepreneurship. And I said, you know what, I'm sick of making promises to myself about starting a business or, you know, take it. And this was when I was like 13, 14, 15. Well, it would have been 13, uh, 13, yeah, end of when I was 13. So 2012, like 12, 2012 to 2013. And I basically said to myself, man, like, I've always wanted to have abs and all this stuff, like the dream of having abs and being shredded and being machine and being big. And then also want to be an entrepreneur, all this stuff. And then, you know, I, I set my, it was like, uh, it was, what was it? I remember I went to my uncle Victor's, who's like a billionaire in Australia. I went to his house, which is like a 40 million, $50 million house in Australia with the view of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and all this stuff. And I just was in awe of his wealth. I'm like, I wanna do that. And that's what got me started with entrepreneurship that year. And I was also like, you know, I wanna get my health in order, obviously. And you know, I was learning more and more that, you know, if you're not swimming five days a week, which basically guarantees you're gonna be healthy and you can eat whatever you want, you actually gotta be on top of what you eat and how you train and all this stuff. You gotta put a plan together. And that's what I did. I'm like, mom, can you buy me these, you know, $5, $10 plastic weights with sand in them, like dumbbells? And she did. And I was there in the in the garage smelling fumes on the dirty floor, doing you know, internet uh, workouts and stuff from the gym. And to this day, I still go to the gym five, six days a week. Um, that's why I'm huge. But um, running was this other thing too. It's like one thing you go to the gym and be big, but if you don't have functional cardio and functional strength, what are you doing? Like I see so many dudes in the gym, I'm like, could this guy run five kilometers nonstop at a reasonable pace, at a, at a six minute pace? Probably not, he'd probably pass the fuck out. Um, can he do you know, 20 pull-ups? Can he swim you know, three kilometers without passing out? Uh, probably not is the answer to most of those questions. To, for these meatheads, and, I, and you know, at the end of the day, I see myself. I, I always like to look back to ancient Greece and look at functional uh, sports and functional health. And anyway, so that year, I remember around August, I I signed up for the quarter marathon, which is not even worth saying quarter marathon. Just call it 10, 11 kilometers. Uh, it was for the Sutherland to surf, and I have pictures somewhere, but they're terrible photos. But I, it really felt really hard. But I did. My mum was there to support me, one of my favorite memories, because she wasn't always at my sports stuff, but there she was, and that I really liked. And I remember she had a bacon and egg McMuffin for me at the uh, finish line, so she's the best. Um, but from there, it um, that was like 14, 15, let's say. Um, and then it became my own thing, you know. Def I mean, I did all the training on my own. I remember, so back to that first day of 2013, probably, or 20, yeah, 2013, I set my alarm, 5 a.m., let's go run, because it was a running track around the corner of where I lived in Sylvania Waters. I'm like, let's go there. And I, I woke up at 5 a.m., I'm like, yeah, let's fucking do this, new year, new me. And I ran to the end of the road, the cul-de-sac. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? I'm going home, dude, what the fuck, runner? What a loser. And I gave up on the 1st of January, 2013. And then the next day, I forgot to change the alarm. So it went off at five o'clock and I'm like, you know what? I'm awake now, let's go do this run. And I made it to the athletics track and I basically jogged around. And like, you never, people don't realize, if you do not train cardio, if you do not actually train cardio, your heart and your lungs are so ill-prepared for anything. But, and those people who are like train consistently, run every day and do swimming every day or something like that every day, their heart and lungs are so much superior to yours, so far superior to yours, you have no understanding, right? And I just see that with myself. When I take a few months off and I'm taking it easy, I'm just going to the gym every day, like slowly, slowly going through the motions, compared to when I'm running every single day, my heart and lung capacity is so much better. It's, it's not even an order of magnitude better. It's like three orders of magnitude better. I go from my like, holy shit, I got to take a break after 1.5 kilometers to like, I could do 21 kilometers without stopping at like 6.30, six minute pace. Just like so much better, it's insane. But anyway, and then after, you know, I did the, the Sutherland to, to surf, the, the 11K in August 2013. I, you know, still trained on and off, maybe one or two runs a week, um, very irregularly without discipline. 
And then when I left high school in 2017, 2018, I didn't really have my shit together. I didn't really train. I was trying to figure out my life. But in, when I went to Europe in 2018, I, I would do some runs around new cities. I really like running as a way to explore a city. I'm not gonna hop on some stupid red bus when I, can, when I one, know all the history about the city because I read about it before I got there. And number two, I could run it. Run a city and you're gonna find some things you weren't gonna see on a red bus tour. Um, and uh, when I got back to Australia at the start of 2019, I was dating a Chilean girl, I remember. I was living in Bondi on North Head, South Head Road or something. And I just was crazy enough. And at the peak of summer in Australia, like 41 degrees, I went out to Parramatta or somewhere in the bush to do a half marathon. And I thought I prepared because I was running, you know, a couple of days a week that, back then. Uh, but I, I always ran on the road. I never did trail. And I get there and it's all trail. I'm like, oh shit. It was just like a, I think it was like a four kilometer trail over like a hill. I was like, I'm about to, you know, die here. And I did. I did, you know, a quarter marathon, uh, a half marathon, but I really died. It was really hard. And it took me like four hours because it was trail instead of road. And I never trained for that. But I kept running. 2019, I kept running. I signed up for a marathon, the Barcelona marathon. And uh, I was very broke at the time. And my girlfriend at the time, Hungarian girl, said to me, I said, I'm going to do the Barcelona marathon. She said to me, word for it, I wrote it down in my diary. She said, you cannot run that marathon. Now, I didn't take that very well. I didn't say anything to her, but I said, okay, thanks for that. And here's the difference between negative and positive mindsets. And not even negative, positive, and what I like, which is can-do mindsets, right? My mom is not always a positive person, to say the least, right? I would call her a negative person a lot of the time. If she's in a bad state of mind, she'll be in a negative state of mind. And that's how, which is like everybody. But my mother, who can be negative, even in, when I said, hey, I want to do the Barcelona, Ma Barcelona Marathon, she didn't say, you can't do that. She said, how are you going to do that? What's your plan? And I respect that. If someone comes to you with a crazy idea, you don't say, you can't do that. You can't do that. You said, hey, I, might have, you know, I have some doubts, but how can you do it? What's your plan? And I was like, you know what? Uh, I don't have one, but I'll tell you. I'm gonna run three, four days a week. I'm gonna increase my mileage until the final day and you know, stretch and learn how to do the stre proper stretching, learn how to do this and that, and work my way up. She goes, all right, George. If you can, try it, why not? Um, and all you I need, I've had such little encouragement in my fucking life and so much negativity that you give me a little bit of encouragement, I hold on to that for a very long fucking time. I never forget it. Um, and I was going to do the Barcelona mouth and I booked the ticket and everything. I remember my girlfriend was like, you cannot do that. I was like, great. Well, one, I hate you now. And number two, um, when I cross the finish line or when I'm having, you know, struggling to get through the uh, uh, marathon, I'm going to think of you saying I can't. And I'm going to think, fuck you. Um, and uh, so Barcelona, Barcelona marathon comes around. I'm in Barcelona. I'm ready. I was, uh, I would have, it would have been tough, but I was going to do the marathon. And uh, I was confident I could, could do it, then COVID came and it was canceled, which sucked. I didn't even get a refund for it, which is bullshit. But uh, I kept running through 2020. Uh, I got pretty shredded back then, like six pack shredded. So that dream of what, uh, seven years prior came true. I went to Mexico and all this stuff uh, in 2021. And I was broke, but I was shredded in 2021. And I uh, kept running, I was running more than ever. I ran more in 2021 training wise than ever in my life until now in 2024. And I ran a marathon on the hottest day in recorded Mediterranean history in peak summer in Sicilia, from Ragusa to the sea, basically. And it was, uh, it was quite tough to say the least, it took me four hours, um, but I did it. It was very fucking hot, but I did it. So I proved my ex-girlfriend wrong, even though I didn't think she meant anything by it, but I think it was more just Eastern European um, negativity which is normal. So I don't blame her, I blame the system. But I did that marathon, um, and then uh, I always, I did one or two ocean swims for Ocean Man, the one in Yanapa in Cyprus. I did one last year in Palermo, in Sicilia again. Um, but uh, last year I did my first Spartan, which was a 10K in Cesenatico, which was very fucking hard but I got through it, struggling. I did a 5K Spartan last year in Sparti, um, which I did was a bit better, right? But I was still a bit overweight. And then I did the 10K in Mallorca, 
this year, which was tough, but I managed. And then I, of course, trained my ass off for the 21K beast in Andorra. The best form physically, like muscle-wise, cardio-wise I've ever been. And while I was on the run, going over the mountains in Andorra, I was like, this is, I was in extreme pain. I'm like, you know what? I never have to do any ultra races again in my life like this because I've proven myself. So George, don't do it. Don't do anything crazy. You don't need to go through this pain. So that lasted about two hours before I reached the finish line. I'm like, this was not that hard. It was hard, but I can, I, I can see that I have more capacity. And also my training wasn't that great. And also I had tonsillitis. So my throat was burning up and I had a fever and I still did it and I still finished, right? So then the question stands. It brings me to this point where we are today. What would be the craziest thing I could do? And another, another you know, caveat here. You need people in your life who push you. Now we know that. But you need people who in your life who are just as, if not crazier than you. Now, Gareth Everett, who I'm doing the Broker Banter podcast with, he's just as, if not crazier than me. Uh, Mark Patchen, uh, Marco, uh, Australian uh, entrepreneur who was a previous client of mine. We met up in uh, Barcelona a couple of times, saw him a couple of weeks ago. He sent me a couple of bowls of apparently the best olive oil in the world, but it's from Spain, so I'll have to judge them all. Um, but he, uh, we had a really good conversation and he talked about challenges, actually quests is what he said. And you know, these are things that you do in your life that somehow bring you meaning, you know? Um, for example, there was this, there's this challenge, there's this quest to take a tuk-tuk the whole way through India. Now that's, you know, with a couple mates. Now that's pretty cool, right, as a quest. Um, it's just like, what's your quest? And for me, I'm, I'm kind of thinking, and Gareth is in the kind of the same mindset of doing big things to you know, bring meaning to ourselves and, and maybe you know, raise some money for charity, whatever it might be. Um, and I'm you know, 25 now, I'm having a bit of a quarter life crisis. I'm like, okay, well, I've built up a good business for myself. I've achieved some stuff, but what's next? You know, I want to do big things. And I do have this desire for some form of greatness for doing you know, good things. So it's like, I've been, I was drawn just thinking, I was in money with my mom, I was just thinking, imagine if I ran from the most northerly point to the most southerly point of mainland Greece. That would be crazy and I'd be the first person to do it. And I think what's cool about it is now I'm not an athlete, I'm just a regular dude. Um, and maybe it takes a fucking month, but how amazing would that be? I'd be the first person to do it, I can raise some money for charity, and more than anything I can prove that a normal Greek kid can achieve something, right? Don't forget, I came to Greece Sure, I'm Australian, but I came to Greece with no money, broke actually, negative seven grand, and I went and lived in Victoria for a couple of years, in the worst suburb in the country. And I achieved success, in my, at least in my eyes, and I think it's an indication that if you're Greek and you aren't even living in the worst suburb in Greece, you could do the same thing. You can do the same and more, because I don't have a degree. All I have is an Australian accent, and I'm pretty good at sales. That's pretty much it. So I think Greeks can achieve a lot. Um, and I think running across Greece is the, the story. What I'm trying to get across with that is if I can run across Greece and I'm not an athlete, you can do more than you think you can, you know, as a, as a young Greek person. Which I really believe. I think Greeks underestimate themselves. I think a lot of people underestimate themselves across the world. And sure, they do in the West, but in Eastern Europe, in the Middle East, in, in India, in bloody China, in Africa, where the system doesn't sh you know, help you, you need to believe in yourself double, twofold because it's even harder to even find any success. But with this beautiful thing we call the internet, one, you can hear stories of successful people, be inspired by them and get started on your own. Um, so that's what I believe this run across Greece, I'm gonna call it the march across Greece is about. So that is a long explanation for kind of why I want to do it, but now let's talk about how I'm going to do it. So I'm thinking one, I obviously need to train. I obviously need to uh, get my knees, to be honest, hips and ankles and back used to basically running 80 kilometers a day. Because let's say, for example, and it's a march across Greece. Um, so it doesn't have to be running at full speed every time, but we're basically talking about 1200 kilometers, right? Divided by 30. At a minimum, we're talking about, uh, divided by 30, we're talking about 40 kilometers a day, basically a kilometer, a uh, marathon a day for 30 days. Now, firstly, that's if 
That's including walking and running. I know I can run confidently 30 to 40 kilometers a day. I'm sorry, I can walk 30 to 40 kilometers a day. No problem. I already walk like 10, 20 kilometers a day because I love walking. So I can probably double that because walking ain't that fucking hard. So I can do like, if I push myself, I probably can do like 50, 60 kilometers a day just walking. And then I can probably run 20, 30 kilometers. So I think I can do like 80 to 100 kilometers a day of running and walking. So if we do 80 kilometers a day for 15 days, we get to 1200 kilometers. So if my goal is two weeks, 15 days, march across Greece, 1200 kilometers, I think that's, really, that's a good thing. I think that's plausible. Now, I still have to run a business at the same time. So I'll be taking my calls and doing my work at the same time. But here's the thing. No, I'm thinking October, November, so I have a couple months to condition my knees more than anything and my heart and my bloody lungs. Uh, for my team, obviously, I think it's going to be Christo and Gail who work with me. Um, we have to rent a support car for two weeks, maybe get some sponsors, organize what charity we, and cause we want to raise money for. Um, and uh, also the weather needs to be reasonable. So, you know, not that it's going to be uh, 10 degrees, but it's going to still be 25 degrees in October, November. But uh, yeah, that's the plan. And uh, that is a bloody quest. And you know what? If, when my kids say, oh, Dad, I don't want to go to school. It's too far to walk. It's a kilometer. I can say, well, like I walked across the country the country. I walk from Bulgaria to Mani Malaka, so you can walk to school, okay? And he's here, put two cinder blocks in your backpack for complaining. Um, that would be cool. My dad law is gonna be lit. Um, so yeah, so the March Across Greece. I do wanna find a very worthy cause. Um, to be honest, I think there's no shortage of worthy causes in Greece because there's so many fucking problems here. Um, I do like the idea of raising some money for the Pirus Vestiki, the fire uh, departments of Greece, maybe for some new um, uh, gear, trucks. I don't know how much money we can put together, but maybe we can put together some money for some modern gear so they can fight fires better, so that they're safer, so that they can put our fires better, maybe raise some money for uh, the victims of all the fires as well, uh, because there are systemic problems in Greece. And when you have systemic problems because of corruption and nepotism and a lack of meritocracy, what that means is, on the ground level, systems don't work. And when systems don't work, people die, right? If you are using a 1949 bloody fire truck, uh, that means you can't put out fires better. If you are, are using outdated oxygen masks, that means people die. It means you, and people die, British Vesta gear, firemen die, and also uh, victims of the fires die. And when people are dying, who are actually trying to help others because of nepotism and because of the meritocracy and corruption in Greece, that pisses me off. And if I can raise some money to fix that, one, by giving, getting more awareness about corruption, all this shit, you know, how it needs to be fixed, that's good. And number two, by raising some money to get them some new gear, I think that would be a good thing to do and that would fill my heart with joy. Um, and if I can do that by doing something as crazy as running, running across Greece, so be it. So yeah, that's kind of my thinking. I would like to kind of, I'm thinking of partnering up with some people, key people. I think the Stelios uh, Foundation, Stelios Adziwan, the guy who made EasyJet, he has a philanthropic foundation. They're obviously good at what they do. They give away money all the time. They're very good people. Maybe teaming up with them, they take care of the raising of the money and put giving it to the people. And I just raise the money and do the run. Um, I think that would be a good thing for Greece. So that's my crazy idea. Let's get on to the next topic. Um, what do we have on the list? So, first things first. Um, so, so, oh, okay, listen to this story. This is hilarious. If you wanna try and understand the Greek mentality, this is a great example, okay? So, Aristotle Onassis, the famous entrepreneur, he says, you know what, I wanna start an airline. He wants to call it Olympic Airlines, right? So he, he creates, he goes to the, uh, he creates a logo. He, of course, he wants um, the Olympic rings as his logo, right? If you look at the Olympic rings, you'll see that the Olympic rings are five rings, right? Blue, black, red, yellow, and green, right? Now, 
he wanted to use that. But the copyright department of Greece was like, hey, we can't, you can't use that because it's for the Olympics, dude. It's too similar. Then he was like, you know what? So if you look at the rings, there they are. There are the rings. Five rings, right? And then Onassis was like, I guarantee, this, is, this actually happened. There was a boardroom where Onassis was like this. Okay, okay, messing me, messing me. He got his pen and a little napkin. He drew the five rings of the Olympics, right? And then this is what he did. He added another ring to the end of it, right? So it's uh, six rings total, uh, six rings total. And you think I'm joking. Google Olympic Airways logo and look at it, right? Look at that. It's just an extra ring here. It's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's not even symmetrical. You know a logo designer wouldn't do that because that is like OCD nightmare. Aristotle and NASA just said, you know what? I'm going to add another ring to the Olympic rings. So we don't have a problem. And that's exactly what he did. And that is still the Olympic Airways logo. That's how he got around the copyright thing. He just added a ring. <laughs> what? That is dope. Anyway, so a little silliness for you. Um, what else, what else, what else? So, um, uh, let's tell one more story then we'll wrap it up. Huh? So what else do we have here? Okay, here's a little story for you, a little history story. Um, well, let's, let's tackle this one actually. So Greek population decline. Now population decline is obviously a terrible thing for any country, um, but it's especially bad when your neighbor who you've had a mixed history with is not declining in population, but instead growing and is already 17 million people bigger than you, right? So the population of Greece is roughly 10 to 11 million people. It's going down every year. Um, Turkey's population is 80 million and it's going up every year. We are deathly scared of Turkey. That's why we have um, a large standing army of like a couple hundred thousand. That's why we have military conscription in Greece. It is really the, why, the reason why a lot of things are the way they are in Greece is because Turkey has done what they have done into Greece, including genocide, massacres, uh, 400 years of occupation, slavery, etc. But we're still scared of them and that's that. And don't even forget the invasion of, Greece, of uh, Cyprus, which hasn't ended, an occupation. So it is a very bad thing when Greece has a population decline every year. Now, you gotta get specific. Greece as a country is declining in population. Uh, the city, and that's in part because everyone from the smaller towns and islands are moving to the big cities. So Athens as a city has not declined in population. Every year it's increased and it still increases. And you can see that from the housing crisis. But um, there's other things you need to consider because this isn't a, even a Greece problem anymore. Now, one, Greece's population didn't only stop, uh, only started declining after 2008. So not just did we get hit with losing $100 billion from our $350 billion GDP, which we're now at $250 billion GDP and we're 13, 15 years later, but also, 16, um, but also our population started to decline. So they really hit us, you know, where it, uh, where it hurt the most. Now, Greece's population decline is bad because we have an aging economy. Our, our elders, our grandparents and parents are the biggest generations. And what that means for an econ economy is the tax base of the millennials and Gen Z, the, the work that we do and the, the taxes that we pay, pay for the pensions basically, and the road systems and the, and the hospitals of the grandparents and parents, our grandparents and parents. And when that millennial and Gen Z generations are very small and smaller and smaller, um, that means it's harder and harder to pay for those pensions actively, right? And also, when your country has 160% debt to GDP ratio, it's even harder to pay uh, for our elders. Now, I don't believe it's a bad thing to pay for our elders. However, our elders spent and borrowed from 
banks negligently for about 50 years and are wildly corrupt and nepotistic and not a meritocracy. What does that mean for young people in Greece? That means in Greece, young people, my generation, and even millennials up to the age of like 35, I believe, we have to pay the debts of our elders for loans that they know they, they knew they couldn't pay for 20 years of taking our loans with the ridiculous G, uh, debt to GDP ratio that we have in Greece. We have to do that under austerity measures, so way harder than they had it. And also we have to pay for their just normal costs and pensions uh, for the rest of our lives. So in most countries where it's just the assumption everywhere, you would assume in Australia, in America, like, of course we have it better than our parents. That's not true in Greece because we have austerity measures. My cousin who's 40 now, he came out of college with a degree, mechanical engineering, and he never worked in that, de that degree. He always worked shitty sales jobs and had to build his own business on the side to pay for everything because he basically got his career stolen from him. Because of why? Because people in this country, the older generations took out loans that they knew they couldn't pay. And people gave them loans that they knew they couldn't pay. And we to this day, and probably till the day that I die, will be paying off those debts. Not fair. So in terms of respect for our elders, we of course do have respect for our elders in Greece, but respect for how they run businesses and how they take out loans and how they manage the economy, terrible. Um, uh, but of course it needs to be fixed, right? So that's kind of the state of affairs in Greece, population-wise and economy-wise. Now we aren't the only country in this predicament. Italy has an aging, aging, aging population and aging economy, although they are a real economy, two trillion in uh, GDP. Uh, Germany has the same problem, aging economy, and most of Europe actually has an aging population. Japan has had it for ages. China's population is declining. They reached their peak uh, population ages ago and they've got an aging economy. Most countries have an aging economy. Basically, any country that doesn't have a high birth rate, which mainly is in Africa and the Middle East, or high immigration rate, which is more like the West, America, Australia, Canada, the UK, um, their population is declining. But throughout history, there have been population declines. It's just crazy for us because we've never seen population declines, right? We've seen the Industrial Revolution, we've seen the dot-com revolution, we've seen the internet age, but now we're seeing the upper echelon. In our lifetime, we will see every single country's population start to decline. Um, and that's crazy. That's a crazy time to be alive, to see populations increase to the point where you never thought they would stop. I remember when I was a kid, like, you're like, China is gonna be massive. They're gonna be bigger than the whole world. And they're not even the most populous country in the world anymore. India is. How crazy is that? We see in Australia, Australia lives off the Chinese economy, by the way, off our coal, off our everything. Now, as China's economy went down, Australia's economy went down, basically. Um, and we're in a world where you need to start bringing immigrants in or somehow increase your birth rate unless you want to lose population, your population is going to decline. By the time I'm an adult in my 50s and 60s, uh, Greece's population will probably be like five or six million. Isn't that nuts? Go look at the projections. Greece's population will half in the next 50 to 60 years. Um, unless we increase our birth rate or start immigration, and Greeks hate immigration, so you better start having more babies, Greece. That's like the same goes for everyone else. But how can you have babies when you have a minimum wage in Greece, which is some of the lowest wages in all of Europe, and you know the government doesn't help in any way? Not good. And you basically need to have a replacement, the replacement rate of baby, of having babies is like 2.5, so you need to have three kids to actually have a growing population. And Greeks used to have a very, very big uh, family, uh, known for having big families. But um, not anymore, man, not anymore. But look, like, I look at the Byzantine East Roman Empire and we, there were always you know, populations increasing and declining, increasing and declining. But um, we are in a population, global population, decline slowly, we will be, um, and definitely in Greece, it's already happening. Now, you might say, George, isn't you know, fewer people having, uh, especially because GDP, GDP is increasing, population is decreasing. You'd assume that you know, more, more money but less people is a good thing. Yeah, but that, you know, of course, wealth isn't distributed equally, right? So that doesn't mean people aren't are getting any richer. 
So we're in this predicament. I don't have any real con uh, solutions for you except for uh, the government should promote people having more babies. Like right now, the Greek government says if you have three babies, if you have three kids or four kids, four boys, whatever, then I have to go to the army. Maybe there's some tax breaks, maybe get some cash. But basically, they better triple and double and quadruple those um, incentives to get people to have more babies because Greece is looking at a very, very depressing future and not just, and maybe existence. If Greece is at 5 million in 50 years and Turkey is past 100 million, it's not going to be very hard to, you know, conquer a bit of land. What are we going to do? You know what I'm saying? And, and what, we're going to have Europe at our back? Germany's population is declining too. It's not a good state of affairs. Um, so yeah, we need to incentivize births more. And if we take care of our economy, a booming economy, economy generally correlates to uh, more babies because people can afford them. Um, so yeah, things need to change structurally in the economy, in the government of Greece, so people believe that they can afford uh, babies. Uh, and population secure, uh, increase is right up there with, and it correlates, I would say, with uh, national defense, you know, and everyone's, you know, a lot of people have said that through the years, but um, yeah, anyway, that's that. Sorry to end this podcast on a depressing note, but um, population decline is never good Inter uh, never a, a, a topic of joy for our country. Uh, alternatively, here's a good note for you. The Cypriot problem in that way doesn't exist. Cyprus's pop Cyprus population is increasing. There are a decent amount of immigrants, especially from Ukraine and Russia and Israel, um, and even Arab countries too. Um, so yeah, Cyprus is another problem. They are tiny, they are a million people, and the population increasing at 10,000 isn't a big deal, but at least the population is increasing, so Cyprus isn't in the same boat. But um, yeah, that's the reality. But anyway, that's it for this week's podcast. We'll see you next week.